Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, I guess we're uh, ready to start the workshop on um, hypertension, uh, if that's okay with everyone. Um, my name is David Engelberg. I'm a family doctor here in Toronto, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ali Preptani. Uh, Dr. Ali Pratani is an internist and endocrinologist at McMaster University and recently promoted to full professor of medicine within the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism, Department of Medicine. He is the founder and director of both the McMaster University and Internal Medicine um, Global Health Program and the Endocrinology and Metabolism Residency Training Program. He's actively involved in several roles at the university, including teaching, clinical work, research, and administra administration at both the undergraduate and postgraduate level. Dr. Pratani is currently on the expert committee for the Diabetes Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines and on the task force for the Tools Implementation for Hypertension Education Canada, and also sits as chair of the Endocrine Hypertension Subgroup on the Clinical Practice Guideline Task Force for Hypertension Canada. So he's an excellent um, presenter for us uh, today on uh, hypertension. He is also a consultant for the South Asian Diabetes Chapter of the, of the Diabetes Canada. Dr. Pratani. Thank you, Dr. Wilbur. Seems like everyone's spread apart. Is that okay? If, or does everyone want to move closer? Or it doesn't matter to me, but it's a big room. Um, thank you for inviting me today, and thank you for your kind words. Um, I have a very short uh, didactic portion, then we'll open it up for lots of interaction, if that's okay. It seems to be the best way to learn, especially at this time of the morning. So these are just some of my disclosures here that I'm going to put up. <clears throat> If you want any more details, just come up to me after I can give you. So uh, just a few things that hopefully we'll get through today with regards to this uh, session is uh, what's new in hypertension. There's not a lot of new stuff compared to last year, but there's some small things that I'll go through with you. And how to really actually make the diagnosis of hypertension, because this has actually changed. Uh, and the key message is we're trying to go away from in-office blood pressure diagnosis and monitoring uh, to out-of-office blood pressure monitoring. And I'll present some of the data regarding that and have some approaches to refractory or resistant uh, hypertension. And at the end of the day, when to refer. And often you probably don't need to refer because hopefully after this session we can have some strategies to deal with even difficult to control hypertension. But there are some times when you may need to refer to a hypertension specialist who could be a family doctor who does a lot of hypertension, an internist or an endocrinologist or a nephrologist or anyone who's actually interested and sees a lot of hypertension. So I thought I'd start off with this quote, which is so true. I think, I think when you've been practicing for a few years, we actually really reflect on this quote, which is by Dr. William Osler. The young physician starts life with 20 drugs for each disease, and the old physician ends life with one drug for 20 diseases. It's so true, isn't it? And you tend to be more practical and do no harm to your patients or demedicalize a lot of our patients. So we all know that blood pressure lowering is very important. You know, we all, often look at uh, global vascular health. I know you just heard about diabetes and probably lipids at some time today that is going to happen. But at the end of the day, if you look at attributable death in terms of cardiovascular disease, hypertension is still number one based on WHO uh, data from about 10, 15 years ago. So the bang for the buck for treating hypertension is huge. And most of the bang for the buck is for lowering reduction of uh, stroke, in particular ischemic and uh, hemorrhagic stroke. As you can see, the percent reduction is, reduction is huge. Then followed by myocardial infarction, heart failure, and I can go on and on, atrial fibrillation, chronic kidney disease, and so on. But, but the big bang for the buck, if you want to take something away today, is, is stroke. In order to really make the diagnosis of hypertension, before even thinking about it, we have to do it properly. Um, and this is often an error that I find with, with a lot of early trainees and even some colleagues. Patients are using a small cuff, they're talking, they've just recently had a coffee, their legs are crossed, and the, di and the cuff size is a pediatric cuff on someone who weighs 300 pounds. They're all going to have hypertension, right? And the opposite, someone who is, uh, is, uh, is really tiny and you, you can't find the small cuff, uh, and you use large size cuff, they're all going to be uh, falsely uh, low blood pressure. So 
there's a very nice uh, handout or, 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 or website that you can go on to, hypertension.ca, which actually has this picture. And I put this, actually, this poster up in every single room in our university uh, clinics to remind uh, 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 trainees or, or healthcare providers who don't do a lot of blood pressure monitoring to actually use this to guide them how to do a blood pressure carefully. And it's so important, honestly. If it's not done properly, you're going to overestimate and underestimate blood pressure, and, and it's going to do your patients harm uh, in the long term. So. In fact, you can even get this if you, if you, there's a, in the website, you can actually ask for a, a, a color copy if you don't have a color printer, and they'll mail it to you, often free for a few copies. So it's a great website to go on to, hypertension.ca. So again, in terms of, uh, you've gone through all this, so to make the diagnosis of hypertension, you often don't want to make it on one measurement. You want several measurements, unless they have an actual hypertensive emergency or an urgency where you can make the diagnosis on the spot. Most of the time, our hypertensives are pretty stable. They have mild to moderate hypertension. And the key message here is, is that if they have a really high blood pressure, let's say arbitrarily less, more than 180 over 110, that's unusual to be white coat. Uh, especially if you repeat it and it still remains above. But if it's below that, you want multiple measurements and you want to look at risk factors. Do they have diabetes? Don't they have diabetes? And the ultimate goal in terms of targets, which I'll go into, are a little bit different. But if you really wanted to remember two or three numbers for diabetes, our goal in the, in the, for most of our diabetics is 130 over 80, and most other people is 140 over 90. But there is a high risk population. Who's heard of the SPRINT study here? The SPRINT study which is a well-talked-about study two, three years ago, right? So these are the patients you probably want to drop their systolic blood pressure carefully if it's the right patient down to 120 systolic. And remember, if you want to remember a rough rule in terms of out-of-office blood pressure uh, targets, they're a little bit lower. So take, go down by 5 millimeter mercury. Outside of diabetes, we've kept diabetes the same at 130 over 80. We battled that, but we decided to keep diabetes at 130 over 80 with limited evidence. So how to, me how to measure blood pressure? Probably the most non-ideal way to do it is you're sitting in front of the patient and you're using a sigma fingangometer because these are highly inaccurate. Um, so we should probably get away from those old archaic devices. Uh, they're inaccurate. They cause a lot of white coat hypertension. They're not calibrated because you've had it for a long time. So the next best way to measure it is just doing an automated uh, blood pressure monitor measurement in the office in front of the patient. Still not ideal, but it's better than using the, the mercury. Um, and the, the key message is to use the upper arm, not to the, use the wrist, except for in selected populations, because the wrist measurements are not very accurate, unless you don't have any way of getting that cuff, and the patient's arm just doesn't meet the technical criteria to use, a, to use an upper arm device. You want multiple readings, ideally stepping out of the office to avoid the common effect of white coat hypertension. Um, that's more of a screening test, unless it's very, very high, but ideally speaking, you want to do some kind of home blood pressure monitoring, either you get a Hypertension Canada-approved device. Uh, there's many available, and the patient takes this and brings back recordings. Again, Hypertension Canada has a very nice uh, website and a log that you can download and give copies to, which I do all the time, and they can do HBPM, home blood pressure monitoring, several measurements, and there's a way to do them. The, the key thing is, is a week before they see you, make them do four readings in a day, two in the morning, two in the evening for seven days, and discard the first day. Because often the first day, they're often a little bit higher than the, the remaining days, just because of the anxiety of doing it on the first day. The most ideal way to do it is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, which actually costs money, unfortunately. We're trying to work with OHIP to see if we can get this covered. It'd be beautiful if the patients that really need this uh, can get uh, free ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. It is available through Life Labs and certain hospitals, but it does cost money. Some of the hypertension clinics can provide these services for free, uh, but again, it's, 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 it is expensive to maintain and upload and stuff, so there is often a nominal cost to it. Why do we want to do out-of-office blood, out blood pressure measurements? Well, they can rule out often white coat hypertension, and we don't want to treat white coat hypertension. If we look at the data, the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality with white coat and normal tension is very similar, although a little bit higher with white coat because it's probably a pre it's a risk factor for real hypertension, but still it's not at that stage where you want to treat it. You can over-treat and cause perhaps harm and side effects with the medications when they don't really need them. ABPM, so ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, which is out of office, has a much better uh, risk factor and prediction of cardiovascular disease, in, per in particular some of the surrogate markers like left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, carotid uh, intimal uh, thickness, and so on. And that is another reason to use uh, uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in addition to avoiding the white coat uh, effect. So this is just some data showing uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease with out of office versus uh, 
ambulatory, uh, out of office versus uh, office. As you can see, LVH is more predictable and, uh, and uh, our marker of kidney disease, albumin uh, excretion ratio is much higher uh, correlated with um, ambulatory versus office blood pressure monitoring. So this is just some data. And this is from about 15 years ago, actually, and it still holds. So again, to summarize, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is more predictive of, again, left ventricular mass index um, for albumin creatinine excretion and uh, carotid IMT, which is intimal medial thickness. So again, another reason why we want to use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring rather than uh, uh, office blood pressure monitoring, for both for monitoring and diagnosis. Oops. So just to summarize, for the high-risk patient, which I'll go into very briefly because I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, is the sprint population. You want a systolic blood pressure. Uh, the, the cutoff initiation was 130, but the target was 120. For diabetes, the initiation and the target is similar, 130 over 80. And if you had to pick, this is a question that I always ask to ask. For diabetes, where does most of the evidence come? Is it for the diastolic blood pressure or is it for the systolic blood pressure? So let's take a show of hands. Who thinks it's systolic? Who thinks it's diastolic? Who thinks it's both? Who thinks it's neither? So we're getting a rough balance of everything. Actually, most of the evidence for grade A evidence for treating blood pressure and diabetes is for diastolic. The 80 is very, there's very good evidence from the HOT study, the HOT study, whereas the systolic targets, we're still trying to debate whether it should be 140 or, a, uh, or, uh, or 120. We're not sure. So we decided, let's pick 130. It's right in between. And so we're not, it's great to see evidence for systolic. It's important to get it down, but we're still not sure 140 versus 120. But diastolic, absolutely, the evidence is very strong for 80. And for most other people, it should be probably 140 or 90 the initiation and the target. And if someone was at really low risk, so if someone was 50, 20 years old, no risk factors, no enduring damage, this is a tough buy-in when I present this data. It probably, we can have higher thresholds. Probably the initiation should be 160 over 100. People freak out at the 100 number. But again, to treat someone who's 20 years old with absolutely no risk factors, the absolute risk reduction is so low, we can probably back off. Doesn't mean we, we ignore them. We need to still follow them along, rule out secondary causes, look for end organ damage, look for other comorbidities. But this is someone who has no risk factors, thin, otherwise healthy, but the only abnormality is that reading in the office, which is reproducible in out-of-office ambulatory blood pressure monitoring also. So targets, again, I've already gone through this. High risk, less than 120 systolic. Diastolic, it wasn't studied in this print study. Diabetes, 130 over 80. And all the others, less than 140 over 90, if you do start therapy. So everyone else outside of those top two categories. So sprint. So who was involved in the sprint? What, what were the patients in the sprint study? These are very, very strict indications. So someone who had vascular disease, either clinical or subclinical. Someone who had CKD. And the CKD was defined there as proteinuria less than one gram per day. And the GFR was between 20 and 59. The risk fact, the risk, 10 year risk was more than 15% or they were more than 75 years old. And if they met any of these criteria, they were considered a sprint patient. And those are the ones, if they were not very frail, again, frailty is a whole, a whole different story, then you would target a, a systolic blood pressure uh, of, of less than 120. What are the downsides? There was an increased risk of renal deterioration. So keep that in mind, potassium abnormalities and hypotension. So you gotta follow them carefully and choose your patients very wisely because it's not for everyone. And the other key message, there were other three key messages. They all had out of office ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So the doctor or the healthcare provider was there, but they stepped out of the office. So it's not the way blood pressure is being checked for the most part. They actually stepped out of the office. So very important, it's not the way we do it where we check in front of the patient. And the two other things were, is that none of these patients were diabetic. The SPRINT study had no diabetes patients, and none of these patients had, had, has had a previous, previous stroke. So a little bit different than many of the patients we see. So again, look at the middle, and that's what I was exactly uh, talking about. None of them had diabetes, none of them had stroke, and none of them had significant uh, renal dysfunction of, of a GFR uh, less than 20. So we gotta pick our patients carefully, and obviously we have to use clinical judgment. If someone's got a blood pressure of 110 or less systolic, you wanna be a little bit careful because you don't wanna dump their blood pressure and cause, cause more harm. So what were the outcomes? So if we picked the right patient, the outcomes were actually quite impressive, and actually this uh, the, the study was uh, terminated uh, early because the findings are so, so good. And if you look at the primary outcome, which was mainly cardiovascular uh, disease in, in whole, it, we had to only treat 61 people to prevent one event over a few years. And heart failure, again, a little bit higher, 125. And 
cardiovascular mortality, 167. But the most impressive thing was the primary outcome, but even all-cause mortality was 83. And if you look at the number needed to harm, which is always important, we don't want to do harm, the numbers were actually higher. So the benefit increased was greater than the risk for the patients that were carefully selected in the SPRINT study. And again, what are some of the harms? Hypotension, syncope, potassium abnormalities, in particular, and acute kidney injury. But again, if the patients were picked carefully, the, the harm was actually quite, uh, quite minimal. So, in someone who does not have compelling indications, what are the first-line treatments? This hasn't really changed much. What has, so it's, again, thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics. Think of A, B, C, D. A for ACE and ARBs, B for beta blockers, but beta blockers don't work well in people who are over 55. C for calcium channel blockers, and these are the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, nifedipine, amlodipine, philodipine, and D for diuretics, the thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics. So the biggest change here is we're trying to sway away from the short-acting diuretics, which are hydrochlorothiazide, which is very short-acting, doesn't work as well, to the longer-acting thiazide-like diuretics, endipamide and chlorothaladone. And the other big change is, is that single pill combinations. If someone is significantly above their target, for example, if their target is more than 20 over 10 above their target, systolic and diastolic respectively, they probably do better with a single pill combination therapy at a lower dose where you maximize efficacy and minimize side effects. As you know, in many chronic diseases, if you top up one drug, you're not gonna get that efficacy and you're probably gonna get less side effects. Most chronic diseases, in terms of therapeutic intervention, most of the benefit is actually half, at half the maximal dose. So that's where the whole thinking about single pill combinations comes into mind, in addition to adherence also and patient buy-in. Patients don't like to take four or six drugs. If you can combine drugs in three pills or two pills, it's much more palatable to many of our patients, uh, especially if they're once daily and, and, and with minimal uh, side effects. And if the blood pressure is not controlled, always think about, are they taking it? Because that's probably the most common reason. Do they have a secondary cause? Is the blood pressure being checked in the wrong way? Is there an issue of secondary hypertension? Or is there anything interfering? Are they taking anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, notorious? Patients won't tell you. They might be taking Advils and Motrins and, and other forms of ibuprofen, which are over the counter now. Or they might be taking tons of sodium, or they may be drinking. Alcohol is a very significant cause of sec secondary hypertension, especially chronic alcohol intake. And I've already mentioned uh, the white coat effect. So this is just showing some data regarding hydrochlorothiazide versus chlorothaladone versus indipamide. We know, we know from many studies that, that the, the most proven agents for best blood pressure lowering and outcomes is actually the thiazide like diuretics, which are long acting, in particular chlorothaladone and, dip, and, and dipamide. And as you can see, all events are reduced with these agents, uh, which are statistically significant uh, for the most part. Again, same, pictures telling a thousand words, the efficacy of uh, chlorothaladone is significantly more than hydrochlorothiazide in uh, blood pressure reduction. And this has been shown in ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, 24-hour blood pressure monitoring. So we talked about how to make the diagnosis, home versus uh, office, uh, what to use if someone doesn't have any compelling indications. But what if someone has compelling indications? Then we have to use that compelling, compelling indication to change our mindset and choose that therapy that's best for that patient with that specific compelling indication. So if someone has heart disease, ischemic heart disease, we're gonna choose an agent which has evidence. So ACE inhibition, ARB, maybe beta blocker if they're having angina. Um, so these are the things to think about in terms of compelling indications, and hopefully we all do this. If someone has had a stroke, we know that thiazide-like and a combination of thiazide-like and ACE inhibitors are very beneficial based on the PROGRESS study. If someone has diabetes, there's quite a bit of evidence, especially if they have nephropathy with ACE inhibition or ARB use. So always think about not just the blood pressure, but think about any other adjunct comorbidities or compelling indications. And we always need to think about, I know this is about hypertension today, but at the end of the day, we have to think about vascular health, right? It's just not about blood pressure. It's just not about diabetes. It's just not about lipids. It's that entire patient's endothelium that we want to protect. So lipids and smoking. Smoking is huge, right? Uh, smoking sensation probably has the lowest number needed to treat, but it's probably the most challenging thing to do for our patients because it's, it's just a, a very difficult habit to quit, as we all know. But there are many interventions these days that, that hopefully can help our patients uh, quit smoking. Um, aspirin, I think you had a talk on aspirin, or there is one on aspirin, but the, the benefit of primary prevention and aspirin is actually weak. For most of our primary prevention patients who have not had an event, the benefit for aspirin is actually quite low compared to the risk. So I really think twice with someone who hasn't had an event before prescribing aspirin, we're probably going to be doing more harm for most of our patients, not all. I never say all because 
all and never are very extreme, but think about other vascular protection strategies rather than aspirin, and I would keep that at the bottom of the list these days if they have not had an event. So aspirin has actually fallen down the favor with the large meta-analysis that just came out a few months ago. And there's been several studies showing the weak data for aspirin in primary prevention. So this is a very nice table, and uh, hopefully you'll, uh, I think you have my slides, but I'd be happy to share them. I, I never want to keep them to myself, but if you don't have them, just let the organizer know. I can send, get them sent to all of you. Um, so this is a very nice table that came out from uh, the, the blood pressure, uh, one of the American uh, journalists. It's a quite pretty, and it shows the different compelling indications, and what are some evidence-based proven therapies. So as we know, for heart failure, especially if they have LV dysfunction, we really got to think about beta blockade, ACE, ARB, and even maybe spironolactone, depending on the extent of their NYHA and their LV dysfunction. Post-MI, again, beta blocker and ACE. Uh, diabetes, ACE, ARB, maybe even diuretic if they don't have established uh, renal dysfunction. And chronic kidney disease, again, ACE and ARB. And stroke, again, as I mentioned earlier on, it's, it's basically ACE and a thiazide light diuretic. And the study that showed the combination that was beneficial was actually perindopril and indipamide. You might know this as uh, Corbisol Plus was the brand name that was used. And on the right, you have all the clinical trials showing the evidence. If you're, if you're really interested in looking at the exact data and methodology, they're all on the right. It's a very nice table. You can just uh, go to it. So this is just a little bit of a giggler in the middle of the morning, and this is the physician talking to uh, the patient, and he's actually eating a bag of chips. It's kind of funny because he's, he's trying to check on his blood pressure. So what are the impacts? We know that medications have a lot of impact, but it's not enough. It's very easy for healthcare providers to prescribe a medication, but it takes a lot longer to do behavioral counseling. But we do know from many studies now that the combination of behavior and pharmacology has much more bang for the buck than just medical therapy on its own. So, and the biggest one probably for the bang for the buck is the DASH diet, which can be incorporated with any culture. We always think about the DASH diet being the Mediterranean. It is, it comes from there, but that can be incorporated whether you're South Asian, whether you're Asian. Basically, it's a low-fat diet with lots of fruits and vegetables and uh, low-fat dairy and some nuts and uh, fish. So any culture hopefully can adopt that. Uh, keeping in mind there are some nuances if you're not eating fish and you have to take other sources of healthy protein. Uh, but that's the bottom line. The bottom line is you want to combine all these, okay? So weight control, modified diet, uh, cutting back on your sodium intake, healthy physical activity, meditation, and uh, there is a big study that you might have heard of in the past called the MRFIT study showed that multifactor you know, intervention provided most of the benefit for our cardiovascular patients, so blood pressure, diabetes, and lipids, and so on. And as you can look, the bang for the buck with many of these lifestyle medications is very similar to medical therapy, right? You combine them, you get a synergistic effect. So a little bit about uh, refractory or resistant hypertension. These are the patients who are at above target, and they're using three drugs, which are the appropriate therapies, a diuretic, ACE or ARB, or a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, or their blood pressures are target, but they're using four appropriate drugs. And what basically is shown that uh, when people have resistant hypertension, their risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality is higher, not only based on the hypertension itself, but often there are many other comorbidities that are accounting to the higher risk. And if you look at uh, certain studies, about 20% of patients, uh, depending on the study you look at, have true bill resistant hypertension, probably higher based on the specialized clinics. And one thing important to remember, you don't want to label someone as refractory hypertension unless the blood pressure is done properly, right? So the right size cuff, sitting out of office, otherwise you're going to be labeling a lot of white coats as resistant hypertension, which you're going to overprescribe and do your patients harm rather than good. Um, so what are some of the risk factors for refractory hypertension? Suboptimal therapy. So if someone's 75, no compelling indications, and they don't have a thiazide on board, they don't have a calcium channel blocker on board, they're on a beta blocker, so beta blocker is not the ideal agent. Um, they're having a lot of sodium intake. Um, they have poor adherence because they're taking uh, multiple pills, which are twice daily or thrice daily, and you, have a, and you have to think about secondary hypertension. I really want to focus, and it's all different talk, but many of you are probably having a lot of patients with primary hyperaldosteronism, and we often don't think about it. There's lots of evidence now that this is a much more common cause of secondary hypertension, which is easy, easy to look for and easily treatable. Who's actually seen a case of hyperaldosteronism here? I'm gonna say that all of you have. I think we're just missing them. And I'm, I'm not being, you have a lot of stuff to do if you're mainly primary care here. You guys have to know a lot of stuff, but um, it's a condition that we often don't think about because it's taught in medical school maybe for one hour, and I do a lot of it because it's something that I'm interested in, but we're picking up a lot of primary hyperaldosteronism, um, and it's easily treatable, either surgically or medically. But keep that in mind. 
If you're not sure, just do a renin aldosterone, a potassium and a creatinine. And if you're not sure what that means, then talk to your local hypertension specialist because a lot of patients do have this condition which are not diagnosed. And they're just topped up with many medications they're not getting control. I've already talked about the other two. How do you evaluate this? First, you want to rule out pseudo resistance, right? So making sure you do it the right way. Do it as an out of office. These are very important things. And in about 10%, you're going to find secondary hypertension. So if you have other clues, which I'm not going to go into, that's a whole different topic. But the key thing is to think about secondary causes. Drugs like alcohol, licorice, Advil, Motrin, alcohol. Uh, endocrine causes, pheochromocytoma, hyperaldosteronism, Cushing's. Uh, renal causes, uh, especially chronic kidney disease. These are some of the common causes of secondary hypertension that can be easily checked off or thought about clinically. Again, these are the causes that I wanted. I keep on putting primary hyperaldo in red because it's a much more common cause of secondary hypertension than people have thought earlier on. Um, sleep apnea probably does elevate blood pressure, but the effect is marginal. We know that from recent data. And if you treat sleep apnea, which is very important, it'll help with other a lot of it'll help with a lot of other things. But the reduction in blood pressure by treating sleep apnea is actually quite marginal, contrary to popular thought. But it is important to look for for other reasons. Maybe other mortality issues, and patients feel better because they sleep better. They may have less arrhythmia risk overnight, so they don't die in their sleep, and so on. And always do a very good drug history, not only about prescription drugs, but everything else they're taking, patches, puffers, all these things. You're going to be surprised what people are bringing in there bags right now from when they travel from other countries and so on. You're going to find some interesting things. Again, just to reiterate, a very good drug history is very, very important. In particular, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are over-the-counter, which people won't tell you about. Uh, people won't tell you about uh, birth control pills either often, young women, because it's just not a drug, right? Uh, many people think it's normal. So making sure you do a very good pharmacological uh, history is, is actually very important because stopping one of these things might prevent you from adding therapies, which is really nice for the patient and for you, and it saves the system a lot of money and ongoing monitoring and blood tests that they may need to do. So again, when you're thinking about secondary hypertension or even with hypertension, you want to do the nice history, you want to do good physical, looking for other causes, looking for end organ damage, especially the eyes and the kidneys and the heart, and baseline investigations, not too many. Electrocardiogram, electrolytes, creatinine, and a glucose for comorbidities, lipids for comorbidities, and that's probably all you need initially. And based on that, you might need to do additional studies if you're thinking about secondary causes and if you want to use certain therapies. Does everyone need an echocardio echocardiogram? No, it's, it's not choosing wisely. If they have a history of heart failure, they have congestive heart failure clinically, whole different story, right? But everyone does not need uh, echocardiography. Does everyone need a test for pheochromocytoma? No. If someone has no other symptoms or uh, signs of pheochromocytoma, you're probably going to get false positive. So again, choose your test wisely because otherwise you're going to be scratching your head. You might get a lot of false positives and so on. Again, if you do think about secondary hypertension, you're already going to have a lot of these tests available anyways. So you're going to have your creatinine, you're going to have your potassium. Is TSH necessary? Unless you're significantly hypo or hypothyroid, it's probably not going to contribute a lot to hypertension, but it's something easy to do, right? It's a simple test to order, and, 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 and it's, it's, I don't think it'd be faulted in this case. Uh, a sleep study, if they have other indications for sleep apnea. Aldosterone and renin, again, I should have put that in red, but if someone has refractory hypertension, low normal potassium, even low normal, um, family history of hyperaldosteronism or an adrenal incidentaloma, think about uh, hyperaldosteronism, and that's when you want to do upright aldosterone, renin, a potassium, and a creatinine. If someone has renal artery stenosis, you may think of intervention, I mean a diagnostic study, but we have several studies showing that, that in most patients with renal artery stenosis, atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis, medical therapy does as well as intervention, whether you do a bypass or, or interventional radiology puts in a stent in the renal arteries. If you're younger, it's different because then you might be dealing with fibromuscular dysplasia, which is a whole different pathological disease. And that's why you probably want to get nephrology involved anyways. If you want to think about Cushing's clinically, you can do a 24-hour urine-free cortisol, UFC, urine-free cortisol. I always want to explain the short forms there. And pheochromocytoma, metanephrines and catecholamines, and echo as indicated clinically. So just in general, what are some of the optimal meds modifications? Um, remember, it's the long-acting thiazide like diuretics, colthalidone and indipamide. ACEs and ARBs, don't combine them because we cause more harm. And dihydropyridine, once daily calcium channel blockers. We have a lot of them that are once daily now, the extended re release preparations. I put down uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists there because for when you ruled out secondary causes and they're still refractory, 
and there's no other reason, we've really moved to a spironolactone. Wonderful drug, and I'll show you a study called the Pathway 2 study showing that once you've, they're on their ideal standardized therapies that are above that, adding spironolactone, even in low doses, does wonders for blood pressure control. It's a really easy to use drug, quite safe, and you don't need much of it to actually get good blood pressure control. It's a beautiful drug. Think about it much earlier than we were in the past. Beta blockers are usually for compelling indications. They don't work as well for patients who are over 55 or 60. And if you need rate control, you always can think about beta blockers or other calcium channel blockers. And if someone has a lot of volume excess, then that's where the loop diuretics come in, such as furosemide. And then lower down the list are sort of more fourth-line drugs. When you've exhausted everything and you ruled out everything else or doing it the right way, there's no white coat, then you might think of drugs like uh, alpha-1 blockers and amiloride and, and methyl dopa and so on, hydralazine and so on. But probably by that time, you've already talked to a colleague who does a lot of blood pressure anyways. So this is a study that I was talking about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. What this did is it, it compared patients who are on standardized therapy, so ACE or ARB, uh, calcium channel blocker and a thiazide light diuretic, and they either added spironolactone versus placebo versus bisoprolol versus doxazosin. And guess who did the best? Patients on spironolactone, right? So a little small table to read, but I'm just going to summarize for you. The bottom line is, is that adding spironolactone on top of standardized therapies, they do much better than adding other therapies such as beta blockade or alpha blockers and so on. So the way to go for refractory hypertension after you've had them on the traditional therapies is adding a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, such as spironolactone. Low dose to start off with. Watch their potassium and creatinine very carefully at 25 to 50 milligram a day. There is another uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist called eplenorone. It's very expensive, and I think it's hard to get now. Um, the only advantage of eplenorone is, is it doesn't cause the gynecomastia in men. If you start slowly, it's not that huge effect in men, as long as you warn them of it and you start slowly. So approach to uh, hypertension or difficult to treat hypertension, rule out white coat or pseudo resistance. Out of office, blood pressure monitoring is very, very important and stop drugs that are interfering, anti-inflammatories, if they don't need a birth control pill. And then optimize the current regimen, use the standardized therapies, uh, rule out secondary causes as, as I've talked about. Once daily regimens, uh, polypill combinations, these things are gonna improve adherence. Uh, and then always think about the lifestyle stuff, right? We can't forget about uh, so sodium restriction, optimal diets such as the culturally, culturally friendly DASH diet, minimal alcohol use, activity, meditation, and, and just the healthy uh, behavior are very important. And think about secondary causes, as I mentioned earlier on. And then when to think about referring to a hypertension specialist. This is a table that I just included that we have so much to choose from, and I've talked about many of these therapies. This is just a table showing the doses and stuff, and this is something you can get from many, many pharmacopoeias, or I can share this with you, but it's from a very nice article from CMAG in 2014, which shows all the available therapies that we have in Canada right now for blood pressure reduction based on compelling indications and the dosing and, and some of the side effects. I've already spoken about this, how to improve adherence. Just talking to your patients, getting buy-in, right? Taking things on a regular basis at a time when it's convenient. So associating with some activity, brushing their teeth, sleeping, any activity that links them to actually um, um, taking their medications in general. Once daily dosing, poly pills, and for the elderly who have difficulty remembering, using blister packaging, right? That's really, really important. So I've already talked about that, and just because I'm talking about the single pill combination therapies, there's actually evidence. So it's not just me talking about it. There's actually evidence that using single pill combinations uh, does improve uh, adherence and uh, efficacy. Uh, with regards to the combination therapies. And there's two key studies, the HOPE-3 study and the COMPLISH study. What are some other st strategies to improve adherence? We tend not to use compliance, right? Adherence, bedtime dosing of one agent. In fact, there is one study showing that if you take a bedtime dose of one agent, you may improve cardiovascular uh, outcomes. Again, one small study. It wasn't the best study, but if someone's taking two agents, you might want to consider one in the morning, one at night for some of this uh, data. There's no harm, probably, so it might be a reasonable to consider. Uh, and I've already talked about many of these other things uh, already. So when to refer? If it's truly refractory, there's never a downside. If it's truly refractory, you're having a difficult time, they're having multiple side effects, there's a secondary cause that you feel uncomfortable with, um, then it's probably reasonable to refer to a hypertension specialist. And that doesn't mean a specialist in terms of a Royal College certified specialist. It could be a family. There are a lot of family doctors who, who do complicated hypertension because that's what they like doing. 
Um, the other one is uh, end organ damage that re requires more specialized care. For example, if someone has significant hypertension is on their way to dialysis, their GFR is like 10, then it's probably worthwhile to get your nephrologist involved, right? So if someone's having significant heart failure, then maybe the cardiologist should be involved. So it all depends on, 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 on the type of end organ damage, but hopefully we can prevent a lot of this. And a lot of the patients you see are probably not as complicated early on, so you can probably manage them early on with a little bit of help uh, as needed. i um, done my didactic part. And we have lots of time for questions and, and, and some interaction stuff. But this is the site that I wanted to talk about, hypertension.ca. It's free. I don't get paid anything. I get a, a lunch when we do guidelines. But I just I wanted to share that this is a very nice site. And I encourage all of you, it's free. And there's lots of good information for physicians, healthcare providers, and patients to capture from here. So, uh, oops. That's, I just have a few questions. And maybe we can do that and start our interactive cases if that's okay. So actually, the first question is, uh, the SPRINT study included all patients but one of the following. A, stroke, B, GFR less than 50, C, already on BP meds, and D, uh, previous uh, vascular disease. So what's the right answer? Which one is, should not be there? So I'm not sure how this works. Do we, are we giving it some time, or is it... Uh, So this is gonna tell us if everyone's really, really smart or everyone's really sleeping, right? In this early wee hours. Good, so most people did, you're right. So it didn't include patients with stroke or diabetes, right? So very good. Next slide. So what method of blood pressure monitoring is least accurate and least predictive of, of outcomes? Home, office, 24-hour ambulatory, or the office syngammometer? Which one's the least accurate? So hopefully I drilled this one in, right? And Although most of you probably know the answer to this, yeah. Excellent, almost 100%. Sometimes there's air, you press the wrong button, I understand, right? You know, you're tired and stuff, and I'm sure everyone got 100% though. Okay, next slide. What is the most underdiagnosed cause? I'm sure I've sounded like a broken wheel here, right? Broken record, sorry. What is the most underdiagnosed cause of secondary hypertension? Cushing's? primary hyperaldosteronism, pheochromocytoma, or coarctation of the aorta? <clears throat> Excellent, good. Next slide. Yeah, so that's a, so I knew I, that's a great question, okay? So the bottom line is, is don't worry about it initially, just do the tests, and then deal with interpretation after. If you get, so ACEs, ACEs and ARBs cause a false negative, okay? Ideally speaking, if you're not sure, you can either talk to someone or get them off these therapies and repeat in two weeks with therapies that don't interfere. What are the therapies that, that don't, don't interfere with alpha, with uh, hyperaldo? It's alpha-1 blockers, and I use doxazine, Diltiazem, long-acting, or hydralazine, or a combination. They don't interfere, but everything else has some interference in general. There's a very nice article we published about two years ago in the CMAG. If you just, or I can send it to you somehow, but it's an article that we talked about for the primary care, internal medicine, and family doctors, how to look for primary hyperaldosteronism. It's in CMAG, and uh, if you just look at primary hyperaldo and CMAG, you'll find the article, okay? But I can send it to you if we can talk after, yeah. Could you just say what the test is? Sure. It's uh, renin, R-E-N-I-N, renin, and aldosterone. And is it urine? No, it's plasma. Plasma. Plasma renin, plasma aldosterone, and at the same time do their creatinine and their lights. But to interpret these tests, you've got to look at what their potassium is, what drugs they're on. It's very important because a lot of things interfere with monitoring and interpretation. But I would say just do the test because if they're unequivocally positive, you probably don't need to stop anything. Only if you're getting false, po false negatives or very significant false positives, then you've got to scratch your head and say, should I take them off these drugs for a couple of weeks or four weeks and retest? So for Potassium and creatinine together, yeah. Upright. And it's got to be done upright because renin and aldosterone are posture-dependent hormones. If we're lying down, renin drops, which makes sense. You don't need to control blood pressure as much. If you're standing, you need to rev up your renin and aldo, right, to make sure you can stand. No, they have, to, they have to be sitting or they have to be uh, ambulatory for three, four hours. Would you send them to an ordinary lab or will the lab go ahead and do that? I actually write on my rec, don't lie down before you do this test. And I tell the patient. 
okay? And I actually write it down so when they see the rec, the lab, life labs or whatever, they won't lie them down. So education has to come into here, right? I actually have pre-printed recs for my Aldo screening patients, so I don't have to write all this stuff down, right? I have these two weeks prior recs that I've just put on my desk, on my, my computer, so I know exactly, I don't have to write stuff down, I'm get lazy as your time goes on, right? So I, I, the fasting stuff and all that stuff I put on my recs. I pre-printed recs for diabetes, so I don't have to check off a whole bunch of stuff. It's just there, boom. Feel the best test, again, very rare. Feel is very rare, right? Is a 24 hour urine collection for, for, sorry, for fractionated metanephrins and a corresponding urine creatinine in there too, so make sure you get an adequate collection. So 24 hour urine fractionated metanephrins and a corresponding 24 hour urine creatinine. And that just tells you if, it's, if you're, gonna, you're gonna make sure you're gonna get a good collection. Fios are very rare, right? Hyperaldo is very common. But if you think about a fio, you need to investigate. Who's seen a fio chromocytoma or been involved with the fio? So very few people, right? It's, yeah, not bad. No, I see a lot of them, but again, I'm, I'm in a tertiary care center, and that's what I do, right? My endocrine hypertension is what I do, so it's all different. How many slipped, how many uh, well babies do I see? Zero, except for my family, right? But uh, we all have our own sort of uh, niches here. For, for hypertension, the data is very weak. So generally speaking, I would say no. Uh, generally speaking, no. Because does hyperpara, the question is, does hyperpara cause hypertension? We don't know. If it does, it's probably very marginal. Um, do, if we treat hyperpara, does blood pressure get better? We don't know. So when do I treat test for hyperpara, like a calcium, is if they've had kidney stones, you know, osteoporosis, fractures, then it's a whole different story. But for hypertension, I think there's no good evidence either way. We're picking up a lot of incidental mild hypercalcemia because of screening. This is like TSH, right? Screening, subclinical thyroid disease, overdiagnosed and overtreated unnecessarily. So we have to choose wisely. Excellent questions. Next slide. Four, in your patients with diabetes and nephropathy, what would be your first line therapy? ACE or ARB, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, or thiazide? That's a pretty easy one, I think. So the interactive part is much longer than the didactic. Okay, excellent. So if they didn't have nephropathy, then a thiazide like would be appropriate. But we know that if they have nephropathy, and by definition, nephropathy here is chronic kidney disease or albuminuria, you would probably want to choose an ACE or an ARB. Okay. Next slide. All of the following drugs can cause hypertension except NSAIDs, birth control pills, Sudafed, which is a sympathomimetic, and codeine, which one does not cause hypertension in general? Wow, very good. Codeine doesn't. Next slide, I think that was my last question. But next. Oh, there's one more. So beta blockers are first line therapies in all of the following except Stable angina, diabetes, congestive heart failure with left ventricular dysfunction, and a recent myocardial infarction. So where are they not first line in general? This is a very smart group here. Should have made my questions harder or put six answers down. Yeah, diabetes. So... Unless they have compelling indications, diabetes is not the first line where you would use beta blockers because they may actually cause hypoglycemia unawareness also, right? And there are some studies to show that beta blockers may cause worsening of hyperglycemia mildly. But if they need it, the benefit always a risk. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. I would investigate them before to make it easier to interpret, but absolutely not, absolutely not. In fact, they might help their potassium a little bit, okay? So no, absolutely not. Uh, unless their potassium is low normal, then you've got to watch them carefully. That's your, you're worried about the potassium, right? So it depends where the potassium is sitting, right? But I would investigate them first, but if their potassium is 3.6, 3.7, I'd probably avoid, and you're thinking about hyperaldo, I'd probably avoid the thiazide, because you might drop their potassium further. There's lots of, you have options, you, calcium channel blockers are a great choice there. And if you want to investigate for it, then use one of those clean drugs, doxazosin, for the meantime. They're not evidence-based for mortality, but you're, they're only going to be on it for a few months while you finish investigating, right? Then you can put them back once you ruled it out on evidence-based proven therapies. Yeah, good question. Next slide. 
Next. Okay, final slide before we do the case uh, is, so again, think about out of office blood pressure monitoring based on evidence and avoiding white coat hypertension. And don't forget about lifestyle, right? And global health. So it's not just about one disease, right? Think about lipids and smoking and blood pressure and everything together. And think about compelling indications when you choose an agent, uh, if there is a compelling indication. And we want to really buy in. We, if we, we can prescribe all the therapies in the world, but if, if patients are not taking them, what's the use? So single pill, uh, once daily, long acting, um, minimal side effects. These are important things to think about. Blister packages and a low threshold and truly refractory patients. Think about aldosterone antagonists. In particular, good old friendly spironolactone. Cost like two cents a day. It's such a, or something like that. It's so cheap. Um, and remember for sprint patients, which is a select group of patients, think about a target of less than 120 cautiously. And if they're not at target, ask why. Is there a white coat effect? Are they not taking their medications? Are they taking too much salt? Are there interfering substances, alcohol, and so on? Um, and uh, think about secondary hypertension. And in particular, which secondary hypertension cause? Sorry? Primary hyperaldosteronism, right? Okay. For, so I would say for anything that affects uh, the RAS system or diuretics, I would say I would check their potassium and creatinine in a week's time. And if they're stable, periodically. What does periodically mean? It depends on their risk of dehydration and so on. So probably every few months. But I would check it after any dose increase in a week's time. But if they're low risk for kidney dysfunction, you can check it every few months. But I would definitely check it once seven to ten, in 7 to 10 days' time to make sure that there's nothing happening with worsening or lowering of potassium or the creatinine. Oh, spironolactone, same thing. Now, spironolactone, if they have kidney dysfunction and potassium high pota uh, hyperkalemia, you probably don't want it. If they have hyperkalemia, you probably should not use it, okay, because it can elevate potassium. Uh, and also, if their potassium is high normal, check it in a week's time because you don't want to check it. You don't want to run into the problem because they become very hyperkalemic. I usually start slowly. And in fact, in someone who's older, even 12.5 is fine. Remember, there's no, they've had it for so long. There's no rush. Just get them on it and see what It's like insulin. Get them on it, and then you're going to increase anyways, right? It's the inertia that you want. You want to avoid the inertia of not starting. So I'm a practical person. Get them on it and slowly increase the dose. Yeah. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Did everyone hear that question? So the two questions were how do, how do you tell patients which monitor to buy, right, number one? And the second one is how do you know that monitor that they buy is working well? So I'll answer both those questions. So I don't have any stocks in Costco. I love Costco. So I tell them to go to Costco because I know that they have a good priced Hypertension Canada approved monitor. It's the Omron monitor. And it's sitting when you walk into most Costcos, you turn right and it's right there. Okay, so again, I don't have any stocks. I have no financial disclosure with Costco, but practically that's what I tell them to do. Second question is how do I know it's working? If it's new, it's probably working, but if it's not new, I tell them periodically, bring it into the office, and I'll compare both. Even if they're both white coat, it's fine as long as they're similar. And I allow a few millimeters mercury difference, so that's how I check if they're working. They're all good. They're all hyper, so those are all approved devices because they've been vetted for, they're, 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 they're being calibrated. So if you go onto the website, there's a whole bunch that are on the site. And there's Omron ones, there's other companies, BB True, there's a whole bunch of different companies. But the reason I use Omron is not because I don't have any connections with Omron, but it's just they're not that expensive and they're good devices. Some of them you can even use for AFib. Even if they have an irregular heartbeat, they'll, they'll still capture heart rate and blood pressure even if they have AFib. But that's a whole different, you gotta make sure that they're they're okay in AFib, which many of these patients have also, right? So maybe we can, uh, we have about 40 minutes left and maybe talk about, you know, I think a lot of these cases are, are, are good cases for discussion and maybe we can go through some of these cases. Um, so the first case is a 55-year-old man with hypertension and LV dysfunction. So some thoughts here. This is now the interactive, more interactive part. Any thoughts about blood pressure targets, what blood pressure to use? I hopefully have convinced everyone to use home blood pressure monitoring. But now we're going to think about what should we do for this patient? What would you do for this patient? Okay, it's real hypertension. They're out of target. They have left ventricular dysfunction. What therapies would you consider here? What are some concerns here? So just please, uh, there's no wrong answer, okay? You guys are all bright, and there's never a wrong answer. Uh, medicine is, we know it's not completely black or white. There's a lot of gray areas, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, so there's good evidence for ACE inhibition in LV dysfunction, absolutely. That would probably be my first line agent in this patient, okay? Independent of blood pressure also. Anything else you'd probably want this patient on for other protection from the heart failure point of view? ACE or ARB, I'm gonna use ACE or ARB, okay? I'd probably start ACE first. If they have a cough, I'd probably go on to ARB. So ACE or ARB, some kind of RAS blocking agent. Any other therapy you might consider here? Beta blocker, amazing evidence for beta blocker, right? For LV dysfunction, definitely. And then if you have significant LV dysfunction, if they have an NYHA of three or four, you might add which other therapy? Spernalactone, and there's good data for that from the RAL study, right? And if they have problems with symptomatic heart failure, would you consider another agent for, let's say they're still short of breath, they're in heart failure clinically? No, no mortality benefit, but you wanna make them feel better, so what therapy would you use here? Which diuretic? Yeah, a loop diuretic, furosemide, right? Absolutely, so that's the first case. So the thinking of the first case is think about compelling indications, think about LV dysfunction, and think about evidence-based medicine for these therapies, okay? So nice and short and sweet cases, which brings out a lot of issues, right? And you guys thought about all those things. Number two, a 60-year-old woman with hypertension, diabetes, and proteinuria. So what kind of target, before we go on to number two, what kind of target do you want for number one, if, if easily achievable, blood pressure target? For, okay, so we have 130 over 80. Any other for number one? Okay, good question. So they have no orthostasis. There's no drop. Based on what study? Yeah, you might want to cautiously do 120. But keep in mind, if they're on multiple therapies, the risk is higher. So you want to follow them like a hawk. And the question you asked was fantastic. These are the patients I would do a baseline orthostasis. Slying blood pressure and pulse. Two minutes later, I'll uh, standing blood pressure and pulse. Okay, what about the target for the second patient? What target do you want for the second patient? Sorry? One, is there any data for 120 in diabetics? No data for systolic, right? So we, we don't know. So most of the guidelines would say 130 over 80, okay. What agent would you do, use that, in that patient if you had to pick the first agent? ACE or, sorry? Yeah, ACE or ARB. You probably couldn't be faulted ACE or ARB. Yes? Um, I don't know if you're a resident of the room, but I, I think you, um, so that's the question is, is, uh, is that when someone has advanced kidney disease, like, you know, drop in their GFR, in fact, there's still data that even with advanced GFR, they benefit from ACE inhibition. But you've got to follow them much closer for worsening hyperkalemia and chronic kidney, worsening kidney failure. So, so contrary, they actually are still beneficial. Yeah, in AKI, you would stop them. Yeah, exactly. So they're, all, they're sicker, right? These are the patients who are admitted to hospital or they're quite sick, right? But if someone has a mild rise in their creatinine, no, we allow a 30% increase in creatinine or 30% drop in their GFR. That's okay. As long as you rule out other stuff like NSAIDs and they're not, they're not clinically dehydrated. Obviously, you want to you follow sick day management, like if they get a dehydrating illness, to hold their medications and see someone earlier and check their blood pressures. That's why all my patients are on a blood, have a blood pressure monitor and they record. Yeah. Yeah. Not for diabetes. Not for diabetes. So 120, remember, in the SPRINT study, diabetes was not included. That's the whole exclusion. So in the sprint study, strokes weren't included, diabetics weren't included. High risk patient without those two uh, indicate without those two diseases in the sprint study. That's why one would follow fall under sprint. Two wouldn't because of the diabetes. And the main reason you want to use an ACE or ARB in number two is because of the proteinuria for renal protection, and they may also get cardiovascular protection also. So let's say that 60 year old woman had uh, proteinuria hypertension, diabetes, and their target wasn't, at, sorry, they, they weren't at target, and you ruled out secondary causes, what would you add next to the ACE inhibitor or the ARB? A little bit more challenging now. You have a lot of choices, right? Methyl dopa? No one, right? Yeah. What kind of calcium channel blocker? Yeah, I'd probably use a diet because of the risk. There is a study called the Accomplished Study that in high-risk diabetics, there's more benefit in terms of reducing outcomes with the ACE or ARB combined with the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker versus ACE or ARB plus or minus, plus uh, thiazide-like diuretic. 
If the patient was low risk, you probably go, go either way, either a DHP calcium channel blocker or a thiazide like diuretic such as chlorothaladone and ipamide. So I probably agree. The next step would probably be a DHP calcium channel blocker. It doesn't matter which one you use. You know, the evidence is a lot with amlodipine, but flodipine is cheaper, nifedipine, ER, some kind of dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. Good. Number three. 70-year-old man with hypertension and a stroke one week ago. What kind of target do you want in this gentleman? That's the first question. And we're going to assume the blood pressure is high. You ruled out secondary causes. It's been done properly. The patient's already home now, seeing the family doctor or the primary health care provider or their general internist. What kind of blood pressure target do you want in number three? Yeah. I probably agree. No, I'd agree. I agree. Probably 140 over 90. And what therapy E or therapies would you use in this patient for blood pressure control? And we're always going to remember lifestyle is always there, right? Okay, please don't forget lifestyle. So I know we're therapeutically focused for pharmacology, but don't forget about sodium and alcohol and DASH diet and meditation, all these other things that work really well. So what therapy would you consider using in number four? ACE inhibitor? And? Based on the program, exactly. And which ACE inhibitor would you use based on that study? Which one was studied? Perndopril. So the PROGRESS study looked in post-stroke, ischemic stroke mainly, that the combination of perndopril and dipamide had cardiovascular benefit in addition to blood pressure reduction. So that's the evidence-based therapy you would use, exactly. So I'm trying to make you guys think of compelling indications here, right? Okay. The next slide here is a 48-year-old man with a recent myocardial infarction, normal left ventricular function, and no diabetes. Okay. Which blood pressure agents would you use here? Or agent? Beta blocker, absolutely. At least for a year or two, right? For rhythm protection. Anything else you would consider? I heard? ACE inhibitor? Absolutely, okay. So ACE inhibitor, beta blocker. Sorry? Uh, so, uh, sorry, of course you do aspirin, but blood pressure control. Yeah, no, you're right. Aspirin, lipids, you do all that stuff, right? No smoking. Any other blood pressure agents you would consider using here? So beta blocker, ACE inhibition. Sorry? ARB. ARB, yeah, you can, if, if you have a cough, you can go on to ARB, yeah. I still tend to use more ACE inhibitors. The evidence is a bit better. Okay. Yeah. So... Calcium channel blocker, for if you need it as an add-on. There's no evidence for calcium channel blocker in terms of, unless it's a blood pressure issue for add-on, but your top two would be a beta blocker or some kind of RAS blockade blocking agent, okay? Excellent. Now, there is some data for eplenorone in these patients, but, uh, you know, it's hard to get eplenorone. It's expensive, but uh, the Ephesus study showed in post-MI they may have a benefit with uh, eplenorone being a mineral or corticoid receptor antagonist. Sorry, yes? Yeah. If they're doing well, I don't. I don't meddle around. I leave them on it. If they're not having any harm, we're you know population studies are different than the n of one that's sitting in front of you, right? I agree. We do that all the time. If someone's doing well on a beta blocker, they're not having any side effects, their blood pressure is well controlled, I don't touch them. Let them be. You take them off, their blood pressure goes high, they get ticked off at you, they go see another family doctor. You don't want that to happen, right? Or they'll go, they go see another specialist. Maybe sometimes, maybe you do. But I agree, I wouldn't stop that patient, right? If someone's on simvastatin, where I use a lot of atorvastatin, their LDL is less than two, they're not having any events, I wouldn't change their simvastatin. I would leave them on their simvastatin. If I was starting de novo, I'd probably use a torvastatin. So it all depends on, this is, this is called personalized medicine, right? Sure, I, I do guidelines, but guidelines are, it's a cookbook. When you, when you cook something, you look at the recipe, but you change things around. You might add a little bit more bok choy or whatever you need to add, right? You, don't, you might not use the salad that, you personalize your cooking just the same way you personalize medicine, same way. Okay, number five, I agree. So 39-year-old woman, so a young woman with new hypertension and a potassium of 3.6, she's otherwise healthy. There should be a Y there. So any thoughts here? Sorry? She's on nothing. She's taking nothing over the counter, nothing, no pill, nothing. Good question at that age, right? She's otherwise healthy. She's a thin woman. She feels good. But, the, but the, her primary care physician did a blood pressure. It was 160 over 100. 
this is where you got to really think about primary aldosteronism. Okay, absolutely. Okay, young woman with a normal potassium, but a low normal potassium. Why should she have a low normal potassium? And this is a real case. In fact, she was taking potassium, but still her potassium was 3.6. So this is a patient who you really got to think about. Think about other secondary causes too, right? She didn't look Cushing right. So clinically, I looked at her. She doesn't look Cushing right, so you wouldn't want to do those tests. Cushing's in hypertension. They look Cushing right. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. So is obesity a hard enough risk factor? Um, a lot of people are obese. They don't have metabolic syndrome. So I want to look at more other things. I want to look at their triglycerides and other markers of uh, metabolic syndrome, right? Did they have PCOS in the past? Did they have gestational diabetes? I want to look at their fasting glucose, their A1C. And I'll make a decision just not on obesity, but everything else in combination. This is the clinical gestalt, right? That's a very good question, but I want to, I'd want to look at more data. More data. But this woman has a very high blood pressure, has a lowish potassium. I would definitely investigate this woman for aldo and arenin. And this real case, she turned out to have hyperaldosteronism. And when we investigated her further after the biochemical confirmation, she had an adrenal adenoma that was producing aldosterone. Put her on that. Sorry, she got surgery after spironolactone bridging, and she was cured. And the pathology was compatible with aldosterone producing adenoma, or Kahn syndrome. We used to call it Kahn syndrome, right? Jerome Kahn was the doctor who discovered this disease. So that's investigating for hyperaldo. Number six, a 49-year-old man, his office blood pr- was there, sorry, his office blood pressure was 145 over 92. Okay, otherwise totally healthy and no end organ damage. You did a framing arm on him, and his framing arm was low for overall 10-year risk. So what do you guys think here? Nag him with? Yeah, I agree. So this is a guy who you would probably not treat medically right now. Would you do anything else to make sure it's not... Re- My, this is a guy you give them a blood pressure monitor, right? So he checks it at home, and they're all like 125 over 75. So this is a classic example of someone who's very low risk, low risk clinically who doesn't really have hypertension. He has white coat hypertension. Okay, really, really important. Good. And last case, and then we'll have some time for more questions because it's really good here, interactive, is a 65-year-old man with a GFR of 45, so of moderate kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, proteinuria, and no diabetes, and no stroke. So this is the question that we had earlier about uh, GFR and putting someone on a certain therapy. So what kind of target would you want on this gentleman? GFR of 45, proteinuria, but no diabetes, no history of stroke. This is a sprint patient. Absolutely, okay? You ruled out secondary causes. You ruled out, and it's real. You check the blood pressure at home, it's still 145 over 95, right? So this is someone, and what kind of target would you want on this gentleman? Assuming that you did blood pressure lying and standing, there was no drop. 120 over, we don't know, 120 over 90 probably, right? Or maybe 80, we don't know. But the fact that there's no diabetes, you can probably say 120 over 90. But the systolic, there's evidence based on sprint, probably 120, right? And what would be the first line agent you would use here? ACE or ARB, right? Because of the, because of the kidneys, right? Proteinuria and chronic kidney disease. So these are seven very short and sweet illustrative cases. So many issues come out of one-liners, right? So many things come out. You can, one case you can probably talk about for an hour, but I think I just wanted to illustrate some key issues. Yes? Classic medicine, internal medicine case, right? Is he dizzy? Okay. Okay. And you think this is all because of the autonomic dysfunction of the Parkinson's? Maybe the Cinemet doing it too? The Cinemet does the same thing, right? And the Parkinson's gives you autonomic dysfunction. Does he have diabetes too? Yeah. Yeah. Those are the... Yeah. Those are the toughest cases, you know that? Those are really tough cases. You know, because you know when you're going to start something, you might plummet, Right? So that's the patient where you want to be very, very careful. If you're going to start something, go really slow. And if they get any dizziness, it's about risk and harm, right? Then I would say, we got to leave your blood pressure at 180 because I don't want you to fall and break a hip. This is clinical medicine. You're not going to find that in the guidelines. This is clinical medicine. It's like someone who's frail, elderly in a nursing home. Are you going to target an A1C of less than 7%? No way, right? I'm going to target an A1C of 8.5 or 9 Right? So this is a really common thing we're going to see in our frail elderly. And remember, 
people are getting older, we're going to find that. Parkinson's is getting more common as you get older, right? So that's a really, those are tough cases. And that's where you have to really balance the risk and the benefit. One thing positive there is, is that he's not feeling dizzy when he gets up. So you might want to be very careful. But in that patient, I would tell them to take their blood pressure med at nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's not a very, you're right, it's not a very strong antihypertensive Ramapril, unlike Perindopril, which is much longer, you're right. They're not, you're right. So anecdotally, my beta blocker of choice, anyone with a little bit of evidence, is bisoprolol once a day, good drug. Maltoprolol doesn't work well. Even for AFib, I, do, I still do medicine, internal medicine on the teaching unit. I find my, my I start them off on metoprolol because it's short, I can work on it. But once they're ready to go home, I'll convert them to bisoprolol. I'm using a lot less of atenolol. There's some, a little bit of bad news about atenolol, but my, my go-to beta blocker once daily for most people is bisoprolol, once a day. Easy to use, once a day, not too many side effects. I start at, I start at 2.5. If they're very tenuous, I might even start at 1.25 bisoprolol. Depends. Depends on the patient, right? For most people, 2.5. But the elderly who is sort of soft blood pressure, I might go very, very slow. Uh, especially if they have AFib issues and heart failure issues, I might go slow. So maybe we have like another 20 minutes. I, we went through all the short didactic stuff. The questions, try to make it sort of more, uh, diversity is nice, right? Then we had some cases. And I'd be happy to answer any questions because you've had a really, a lot of good questions. Yes. Yeah. 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 So okay. So you're 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 a good clinician. So you're thinking, what are you gonna do with it? So interestingly enough, if you remember physiology, this is a great question that you had. It gets me excited because women who are pregnant, they're protected from hyperaldo because progesterone is an antagonist of aldosterone. So in fact, hyperaldo quiets down in pregnancy. So number one, it's, pro it's probably protecting them from their hyperaldo. And number two, even if you do find it in pregnancy, you're not gonna use spironolactone anyways, right? Because it's gonna cause fetal effect, like it's gonna cause ambiguity, like a genital ambiguity issues, and you're not gonna operate on them. So probably don't wanna screen in pregnancy. I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't test a pregnant woman for hyperaldo, because like I said, it's, they're protected and you're not gonna treat them anyways any differently. You're gonna avoid those hyperaldo drugs anyways, which is spironolactone or surgical therapy. So I'd let them finish their pregnancy. If there's still hypertension afterwards, then I'd retest them. But in pregnancy, you're gonna use the usual drugs as long as you rule out things like pheochromocytoma, which can, I've seen cases in pregnancy and Cushing syndrome in pregnancy, but they're usually obvious with Cushing's. You know, often, in fact, most women with Cushing's can't get pregnant because cortisol is an, almost an anti-abortifacin. It's, an, it's abortifacin, right? It's uh, one of those type of drugs. Um, but I would treat them with the usual therapies for, for you want to make sure they don't have preeclampsia after 20 weeks as the usual stuff, right? And use the usual drugs if it's just hypertension, you want to treat hypertension. And what's, the, what's approved in pregnancy? Libidolol, uh, methyl dopa, hydralazine, and nifedipine. I use hydralazine the light least because of the reflex tachycardia. So it's libidolol, nifedipine, then methyl dopa. Then if you really need something, hydralazine. But no ASORBs and no diuretics because like you said, they're hypovolemic. You want to try to avoid diuretics as much as possible. And in the Parkinson's patients, I tend to avoid diuretics because then they have to wake up at night, then they're going to fall, right? You got to go pee. You don't want them to pee at night either, right? As much as possible. These are practical considerations. And you really think it's hypertension that needs to be treated? Yes. I would use the same. Drugs for treatment without compelling indications, ACE, ARB, um, calcium channel blockers, uh, thiazide-like diuretics. Um, it probably doesn't matter. If they're a woman of childbearing age, um, you want to make sure they don't get pregnant on the ACE or the ARB. That's important, right? But I would use the same, same therapies if you really think it's hypertension and it needs to be treated. And you ruled out secondary causes. Beta blockers will work, but it's not, the thing is people often feel very tired on beta blockers, right? So I tend not to use them unless there's another compelling indications. I tend to use for non-compelling indications, ACE or ARB, calcium channel blockers, dihydropyridine, or thiazide-like diuretics, either chlorothaladone or indipamide. 
same, exactly the same thing. Beta blockers, they just, people, I don't know, what do you guys, do you find that your patients with beta blockers just, they feel tired, right? Uh, and their heart rate, and their, okay. So the re other reason I would avoid beta blockers is young people, they usually these are the ones who want to run and be active. They can't get their heart rate up, so their stroke volume won't, won't compensate for their cardiac output. So that's another reason, they, they won't be able to do as much, right? When you're on a beta blocker, they'll tire much easier because you prevent them from maximizing their cardiac output. Okay, <laughs> I know this means everyone's probably heard in uh, tweets and social media about ACE inhibitors and lung cancer, right? It's been a new thing lately. Observational studies, not very, they've combined many, many studies. So there is uh, some data. It's not proven yet, but we're going to look at this very closely. I think it's going to be coming up because people are asking about this, about ACE inhibitors causing uh, lung cancer. There's no causative, first of all, it's not a cause-effect relationship, right? Because the hazard ratio is not that high. It may be an association. So right now what I would say is that we don't know 100%, but based on the numbers needed to cause harm, I would not take your patients off ACE inhibitors. Keep them on it until we get more data. But it's a great question, and we haven't ignored it, but I think we're going to get a lot more data now coming out to see if this is a real effect or not. It's not cause or effect. Is it an association? We don't know. But that's the hypothesis right now. Sorry? Yeah, so it's, it may be just a confounding factor, right? And, you know, exactly. So we don't know yet, right? We don't know. Yeah, they get a, you're right. That's a great point. They get a cough. They get a chest x-ray. And is it the ACE inhibitor? Probably not. It's probably the smoking they're doing, right? So, but we don't know. It's these, a lot of confounding factors with observational studies. We, we can't randomize. Yeah. So for diastolic hypertension, what's the best medication? The calcium channel blockers work very well. And the diuretics work very well where beta blockers don't work as well for diastolic hypertension. So I would say the calcium channel blockers are much more effective. And diastolic hypertension is more of a problem in the younger people, where systolic is much of a, more of a problem in the elderly people because of stiff arteries, right? Calcified stiff arteries. Yeah. It's amazing. All the time I see you're right. So that's the whole problem with the white coat doctor or nurse standing there. It's amazing, right? It's the difference in blood. So the, the comment here was an excellent comment is if you really walk out of the office, even in the office, the blood pressure difference between you being in the office and not being in the office is huge. Has everyone experienced that? It's amazing. And even using the wrong size cuff, the residents are talking to the patients. And then I check it again. Even with me there, it's much lower. Just by talking and uncrossing their legs and sitting back. It's, so you've got to really do it the right way, which is the point you're trying to make. You've got to do blood pressure the right way. You have to. Otherwise, you're going to be really treating a lot more people than we should be treating, right? You, know, you don't want to treat just a number. You want to treat the patient, and it's got to be done properly. Sorry? Reverse? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Sorry. Ah, uh, uh huh. Okay. So this is called the the question is Have you seen reverse hypertension? So there is a term for that called masked hypertension. So these are the patients who have a normal blood pressure in the office, but their blood pressure at home is high. So there is data sh to show that in masked hypertension, I didn't talk about that today, that the risk of mortality and morbidity is higher. But what we don't know by treating mass hypertension, do we improve outcomes? That's a new thing in uh, hypertension, uh, the world right now, that we're looking at that now to see if we treat those patients, do we improve outcomes? But we do know that they do worse. And the problem is we don't do that off. We don't, those patients aren't often, often investigated because unless they're for insurance purposes, right? They, they do for insurance purpose, or or they're they're just curious, and these are the patients who are a little bit anxious. They want to check their blood pressure at home, and then maybe they shouldn't be, and they figure out why. Wow, my blood pressure is high in home, but it's great, uh, great in the office. So we don't have much data right now in terms of interventional outcomes and preventing outcomes, but it's a good question. Yeah. So there's data about patients with white coat hypertension have higher risk of becoming hypertensive. We know that. Yeah, so there is some data showing a slightly higher risk, but it's not enough to treat these people. 
there is there are they are slightly higher risk of cardiovascular disease. We we, we know that, but the the risk is not that high that we wish we would treat white coat hypertensives at this stage. They need to be they need to be monitored more carefully. But not to treat them yet. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So if their diabetes is now well controlled and if they have not an in, have an event after metformin, my next go-to agent would probably be an SGLT2. Yes, absolutely. For cardio, we don't know if it's for cardiovascular protection unless you use dapagliflozin, because dapagliflozin is the only drug that's been shown to have improved heart failure outcomes in primary prevention. But for secondary prevention, as you heard, we can use either EMPA or Kana glyphosin. But so the question is, is that. What would be your next drug after metformin? I would say for the most part, you can either pick between SGLT2 or a GLP-1 analog, either liraglutide, semaglutide, or dulaglutide. And that's a whole different topic, diabetes, right? But you're right, you wanna think about cardiovascular protective strategies outside of the hypertension also. So that, may be a, that might be a compelling indication for you maybe to cut back on some of their agents, unless there's another compelling indication for them to be on evidence-based doses. So it depends how low it is to it. But if, they're, if their home blood pressures are 120 over 80, they're not symptomatic, I probably wouldn't change much. But if they start feeling dizzy at home, then I'd probably cut back. So it all depends on how the patient's feeling. But that's a good question because you, know, you don't want to over-treat them in the office, right? Which is how Sprint was different because Sprint was based on out-of-office numbers, not in-office numbers. or 120 or something like whatever, yeah. Sure, sure. If there's no other indication for them to be on the evidence-based dose, then there's no downside as long as their blood pressure's okay. I would be happy to do that, absolutely. I'd be, I'd, I would support that, definitely. Yes? I, what I tell them, so the question is when they're sick, do I routinely tell people to hold their BP medications? So what I do is if they have a blood pressure monitor and they're running low, I tell them to hold it and monitor their blood pressures very carefully. Yeah, I do. Sick day management. As long as there's that, they're monitoring, right? That's the important thing. Yeah, then I tell them to hold it because, you know, as long as they're, if they're sick and their blood pressure is lower, then you want to definitely hold it and then restart it slowly once they're over their intracoronal illness. This is all about education, the sick day management. We do the same thing for our diabetes patients on, on metformin, on blood pressure medications with ACE inhibitors and, and things like that. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So office, hospital patients, you can't compare. They're different, right? They're sick, right? So yeah, so this, all the studies that have been done in hypertension have been done by sitting blood pressures. Yeah. Yeah. Unless they're really, really, I agree. In the hospital, I, I actually want a little bit of a higher blood pressure so they can, I can give them diuretics and they don't become septic and so on, right? So as long as they're, as long as they're not, they're, they're dangerously high, uh, you're right. I just let them be. Um, as long as they're safe, it's safe. So for long-term treatment, it's, that's what you do for uh, outpatient. Yeah. But remember, all the studies in hypertension were outpatient. There's been no inpatient trials of blood pressure treatment. We haven't done them, except for stroke, acute stroke. That's different. But for most treat, uh, studies, it's been outpatient, sitting. Sitting blood pressures. They're sitting, not lying down. Because for most people, lying blood pressures are a little bit lower, appropriately, right? So really, really awesome questions that I learned a lot from also. Um, we still have eight minutes. Uh, we can stop, and I can take questions for the next few minutes. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, I'd be happy to, unless anyone has any other questions that I'd be happy to take right now. Yes? So the question is, is someone with sleep apnea, is there any benefit from CPAP therapy? You'll get a marginal reduction in blood pressure, but not enough probably to improve outcomes from the blood pressure point of view, but there's additional benefits from CPAP. Fatigue, uh, they'll have a better day, sorry? Sorry? 
not from a cardiovascular point of view, not from a hypertension point of view, I should say. You may improve other parameters, maybe less arrhythmias. We just don't know. But there's other benefits. I would say that I would still treat them with CPAP if they have sleep apnea or consider that. But the benefit for blood pressure reduction is not that huge. There was a question there also. Yeah. So once it's positive biochemical workup? Okay, so the really important the question is once you've done the investigations for hyperaldosteronism, what's the next step? So in, in medicine in general, you don't want to do any imaging until you've got a biochemical confirmation because you're going to find incidental omas, which you're going to drive yourself off the wall. So only once you confirm the diagnosis of hyperaldosteronism, then you're going to do, then you're going to do the imaging test, which is you're going to do a CT of the adrenals. And even if the CT adrenals are positive or negative, it doesn't mean that the lesion that you're finding is the culprit because it might be an incidental oma. And if you, even if you don't find something, it still might be a lesion that you're not picking up. That's when you probably want to refer to a specialist who does a lot of hyperaldosteronism. Sorry, I mean... Yeah. So in hyperaldo, the aldo should be high, and the renin should be low. And if depending on the units you're looking at in renin, most of the labs are looking at nanogram per deciliter. If it's more than 140, the ratio, aldosterone to renin ratio, that's, then you should go on to confirmatory testing. And at that time, you should probably be referring. If it's less than 100, based on those units, now you've got to look at your units carefully. As long as you've ruled out drugs that are causing false negatives, it probably rules out the disease. But you've got to look at the drugs on board, too. That was mentioned earlier, right? In order to interpret renin and aldo, you really need to look at all the drugs that are on board and the potassium level and the creatinine level. So acute stroke and hypertension. So within the, so I put this as a week after, right? So they're not really acute anymore. But within the first week, you probably don't want to drop their pressure for ischemic strokes significantly. As long as they're in the first week, as long as they're less than 180 over 100, that's fine for the first week because you want to maintain autoregulation. But after the first week, that's when you want to start treating them as a chronic. So in the first week for ischemic strokes, 180, 160, over 90 to 100, no problems. After that, you want to use the usual targets. And for, for hemorrhagic strokes, again, acutely, probably less than 160, but not too much lower, and less than 100 to 90 to 100 because you want to maintain that autoregulation. If you drop their blood pressure too early or early on, you might worsen their ischemic uh, their, their stroke effects. Okay. So we don't see, this is someone who's in the operating room, they're getting operated on. Okay. So when I think about someone who's got perioperative hypertension, I either think of very poorly controlled pre-op essential hypertension, or they have a secondary cause. And the one you think about, especially with surgery, is a pheochromocytoma. Right? Because surgery can often unmask pheochromocytoma. And I would treat them the same way acutely as I would anyone with a hypertensive emergency with that high blood, diastolic blood pressure. And anesthesia is pretty good usually at, uh, they should be pretty good at managing that blood pressure as long as they don't drop it too quickly. If it's hypertensive emergency, that's a whole different story where they've had a, an organ damage acutely as a result. So it all depends on if it's an emergency or an emergency at that time. So, so this is someone. So this is someone who you really think has indications for therapy. So you've decided that they have an indication for therapy. I would say home blood pressure monitoring. Should, the average should be if it's above 135 or 85 at home. You should probably consider treating if they have an indication for therapy. If they're at that risk level, that they have an indication for therapy. Okay, for most. If they're diabetic, 130 over 80, home, right, home. So again, okay. well, so if the, if the blood pressure is high at home, in the office, um, if it's not really, really high, and you don't have indications to treat at that time, these are the patients you want to send them for home blood pressure monitoring, okay? Either ambulatory with a 24-hour or get them a good monitor and check at home. 
and base it on home blood pressure monitoring. If they already have end organ damage that they have a compelling indication, that's different because if they have proteinuria, they may need an ACE inhibitor anyways, not for the blood pressure, but for the proteinuria. If they have LV dysfunction, they probably need an ACE inhibitor anyways, see? But th you're probably talking about the uncomplicated, no compelling indicators where you wanna really think about, should I be treating that patient? You need more data for that patient. So that's why you gotta look at everything, right? The target, compelling indications, end organ damage, other risk factors, and you want a risk profile, a global risk profile before you decide to treat that patient. It's just like statin therapy. Does everyone need to be on a statin? No, you wanna make sure you have a, some kind of risk stratification because the targets will depending on the risk of the patient. Okay, I think we have a couple more minutes and thank you very much. It was, I really enjoyed this. It's very, Thank you so much, Dr. Perptani. That was really excellent presentation. Thank you for the great cases.